Hello and welcome, everyone. I'm Raj Kumar, President and Editor-in-Chief of DevX. Uh, really delighted to welcome you to this event we are hosting with KPMG on the occasion of the UN General Assembly. This year is their 75th gathering. Normally, we would be doing this in New York. Uh, we would be welcoming you with a sense of real hospitality, those of us at DevX and our colleagues at KPMG. I want to give you that same warm welcome, although we're doing this virtually. Uh, a, an unprecedented moment to have the, the, the General Assembly meeting virtually like this. But we, as you know, at DevX host many events during a, a traditional UN General Assembly week in New York, trying to highlight some of the key issues and themes that the global development community is focused on. And this event, I think, really touches on one of those key themes that we should all know about that is a fascinating topic and that really is gonna drive much of the agenda when we think about the next 10 years of the sustainable development goals. And that is the idea of infra tech. You've, you've probably heard of FinTech, financial technology and ed tech, education technology. We're here to talk about infra tech, the kind of merging of the worlds of infrastructure and digital technology in order to transform the way we do infrastructure to achieve more sustainability, more efficiency, this is a, a big idea and it's happening around the world in many places. And we have a, a tremendous partner in KPMG to discuss this today and a number of experts who are working on InfraTech around the world to dig a little bit deeper in a panel conversation and in a conversation that hopefully pulls in all of you. So thank you for being a part of the event today. Uh, I do wanna mention you can join it in a couple of ways. You can ask questions through this platform, uh, which we will be gathering up and, and we, will, we will take them on and weave them into our discussion. You can also uh, join us on social media on, on various platforms. You can use the hashtag InfraTech and UNGA75, uh, UNGA75. You can um, also, of course, follow the DevX account. And uh, we're gonna be asking you some poll questions today. We're gonna be pulling you to the conversation a number of different ways. So I wanna ask my colleague, Natalie Donback, who's an editorial associate at DevX to just come on screen and join us. Hi, Natalie. Hi, Raj. Hi, everyone. And yeah, thanks for everyone who's dialing in from, from across the globe for this important conversation. Um, and we really make uh, want to make sure to hear from you as well. Um, so I think we actually want to launch for one of our first poll questions here to get your take on this issue. Um, so you should be seeing this on your screen now, um, but it would be great to hear from everyone um, what you think about this question. And how can InfraTech best help advance the SDGs? Do you think that's through innovative last mile connectivity solutions? Or is it by improving the efficiency and sustainability of infrastructure or by creating new investment opportunities? Um, so please have your votes um, and we'll see what you think on the issue as well. So we'll give you a, a few minutes to, to we'll, vote. We'll give you a moment yeah, to do that. As you're doing it, let me just give you a sense of what the what the event is gonna be like today. You know, as you answer this poll question, we're soon gonna be hearing some framing remarks um, from a real leader on these issues who's gonna to help to frame up the, the conversation for us. Then we'll move into a dynamic panel conversation where we'll also hear from you through your questions. Uh, and then we're gonna get some reflections uh, and perspectives specifically focused on the African continent. Um, as we close up the event. So uh, it's gonna be a dynamic and, and fast moving event, uh, but maybe we can take a look at the, the poll results. So it looks like the majority um, believe that by improving the efficiency and sustainability of infrastructure, we can best help advance the SDGs. So uh, hopefully this gets the blood flowing a little bit um, seeing this poll question. And uh, I want to turn it over now to our colleague from KPMG, Richard Threlfall. Um, Richard is a leader on these issues. He directs global infrastructure at KPMG, has a long career in the public and the private sector. He's also leading the firm's uh, impact work. So he's bringing a global perspective and SDGs perspective to this idea of InfraTech. Um, and Richard, I, I just want to ask you to help us frame up the conversation today as we get started. Well, thank you very much, and uh, KPMG certainly be delighted to be uh, supporting this conversation today. Thank you to the fellow pan panelists and all of those who have joined to uh, take part in the conversation. And, and I wanted to start by, by, well, really just following on from that poll question that you've all answered. Um, I wanted the sort of D answer that said all of the above, um, but if I was forced to pick one, um, then my sentiment was entirely with, with where the bulk of the audience went in picking B. And, and if we just reflect on why I think this topic is so important, 
Well, three reasons, really. Firstly, the centrality of infrastructure to the delivery of all of the UN's 17 Sustainable Development Goals. Um, as many of you will know, they are underpinned by 169 targets. And analysis that's been done has shown that um, about 72% um, uh, of those targets are aided by network infrastructure, such as communications or roads and railways. And fully 81% of them uh, are aided by non-work network infrastructure, such as schools and hospitals. So the infrastructure is hugely important to the delivery of the Sustainable Development Goals. Um, and then, of course, specifically, infrastructure is critically important to tackling climate change. Uh, again, we all know that um, energy is the biggest emitter of carbon in the world and transport's a close second. We've seen great progress in the last decade. Um, I think it's now the case that about two thirds of the world um, uh, is in a position where renewable energy is the cheapest form of energy. But that doesn't necessarily, of course, mean that it is providing two thirds of the energy for the world in um, energy infrastructure, far from it. Um, and then on the decarbonisation of transport, um, well, I was quite encouraged to see the uh, headline in today's uh, uh, Times in the UK, for those of you who can read it on the screen, um, sales of eco-friendly cars overtake diesel for the first time. And that's in a country that's frankly been pretty slow on the uptake of electric vehicles. And, and the third way in which I think, and perhaps the most important way um, in which this topic is important um, is because of the efficiency of infrastructure delivery. Um, the construction supply chain uh, is uh, what underpinned the delivery of infrastructure globally, yet um, it has been one of the slowest industries to adopt technology. Um, we have seen that the productivity of the construction industry globally um, has been lagging behind other industries for about the last 20 years. Um, and it really matters. Um, it was some years ago that McKinsey estimated um, that if we could increase the efficiency of the construction industry to what it should be with the aid of technology, then they estimated we should be able to take 40% out of the cost of delivering the world's infrastructure. Well, that's great, but I'd actually like to turn it round and say, well, if the world was still prepared to invest the sums of money they are today in infrastructure, and arguably they should be investing much more, we could buy 66% more infrastructure for the money that we're putting in, if only we were delivering much more efficiently. So, 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 so Raj, that for me is why all this matters. Um, uh, as, as you and other colleagues on this call know, uh, KPMG has, has just concluded um, some supporting work for the World Bank uh, and for the G20 Infrastructure Hub, looking at how to encourage the uptake of InfoTech uh, by governments all over the world. Um, we don't have the time here to, to get into all the detail of the conclusions of that report, but I set them out uh, in a blog which I published last week um, and perhaps we'll touch on some of those as we get into the course of the rest of the conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you Richard and uh, there's so much I want to ask you to follow up on that but I first want to uh, welcome the panelists to join the conversation with us uh, so please uh, do, do turn on your screens. I'll just mention to everyone who's who's following along who's here you can see their pictures and and titles there, Morgan Landy, who directs infrastructure and natural resources of the IFC, and Sue Gorenson, who directs infrastructure in Europe as part of the Sustainable Infrastructure Group at the EBRD, um, and Valerie Dadabi, who's the manager for resource mobilization and partnerships at the African Development Bank. Welcome to the discussion, uh, all of you. Um, Richard, maybe just to, to get us started, you, you kind of ended there with an interesting point that we could buy 66% more infrastructure and certainly there's a huge gap especially in low and middle income countries um i guess the question is right now at this u.n general assembly and really in every capital around the world covid and the pandemic is top of mind is what everybody is talking about everyone is thinking about why should if you were you know actually in new york today at the u.n general assembly and you had a chance with a prime minister or finance minister why should they turn their attention to infotech right now what's the opportunity that maybe uh, that they may be missing um, in capitals around the world. So, Raj, do you want me to pick that one up in the first instance? Yeah, please, please do, and yeah. then we'll, we'll have everybody jump in. 
Yeah, was, well, so firstly, because I think the impact that uh, investment in technology in the infrastructure space can have is so significant for the reasons I, I just set out, particularly in terms of delivering the UN Sustainable Development Goals. But I think it's critical that um, it's not just about what governments do, it's about the partnership between the public sector and the private sector. And, and, and that work that I referred to that we've just done for the World Bank really highlighted how if you could get a framework by government that encourages the role of the private sector and then draws in the innovation and ultimately the efficiency of the private sector, then I think we get the best result overall. And to give a quick example of that, I think one of the most successful examples we've seen over recent years has been the way that the UK government has stimulated the offshore wind market. Now, if we go back about six years ago, investment in offshore wind by the private sector was considered so risky that no private sector company was prepared to do it without any form of support or cover. And indeed, the government went as far as setting up a green investment bank in order to try to provide some risk sharing in that market. But what they then did was they ran a series of auctions um, over a number of years where effectively they were supporting the, the final price of the electricity from that offshore wind market. And isn't it a remarkable thing to observe that in October last year, when they ran the fifth round, and they put about 60 million of subsidy on the table, they ended up concluding the auction paying out not a single pound of subsidy. In five years, we've taken as a market as risky as, as working in the North Sea to something that requires no public sector support, but we've done it because of the supporting public sector framework that was put there in the first place. By reducing that risk, you can help advance the technological development which means that eventually it's an economic business. You can actually make money doing offshore wind in the North Sea. You're right, that's a, that's a remarkable example. Absolutely. Um, maybe Sue, I can bring you into the discussion since you are at EBRD, uh, both providing financing to public and to private entities. And to get your take on what Richard has just described, on uh, what you're seeing in these markets and what the opportunity is around Infratech. What we see is that there's huge opportunities, clearly. And actually, I think because of COVID-19, it's almost a great reset because there's more opportunities. Traditional construction methods, as Richard was mentioning, um, have to change. And we're going to see, we think, more digitalization, more use of new um, drones, um, e-procurement going forward. However, and you mean, um, sorry to interrupt, Sue, you mean because people literally can't uh, get to the construction site correct. safely, they can't socially distance without using those technologies. Exactly. So there has to be a new way forward. However, at EBRD, we, um, as, as you know, we're an IFI focusing on in three continents. A lot of our work is in Europe. Um, and I would since we lend both to the public sector and to the private sector, we have a portfolio of roughly 22 billion, a third of which, almost a third is to the private sector. We see, what we see right now is starting to see a gap um, between the public sector and the private sector. Whereas the private sector is embracing um, new technologies, they're using artificial intelligence, digital twinning to improve, um, maximize revenues, you know, increase efficiency, cut costs, on the public sector, perhaps for capacity reasons, um, lack of experience, we're seeing a bit of a gap. And so this is an area that we're focusing on um, for our public sector clients because we want to narrow that gap and ensure, as you were saying, Richard, more efficient delivery of infrastructure, but also more efficient operation and maintenance, which is key. Yeah, and the long run operation maintenance is a really big part of what makes infrastructure work or fail, particularly when you think of low and middle income countries. There are lots of examples of failed infrastructure based around not planning well for operation and maintenance roads that you know, are beautiful the day they're opened and then fall into disrepair very, very quickly, for example. Um, uh, let, let me bring you into the conversation, Valerie, uh, because you're working at the African Development Bank as well, directly with government. What, what are you seeing here in terms of the priority around infratech and that maybe the gap that, that Sue has referred to? Sure, thanks very much, um, Raj. And again, thanks very, very much as well to KPMG. So I think um, the important um, factor that uh, differentiates maybe Africa from the rest of the world, if you will, is just the size of the infrastructure gap. Um, the needs are about 130 to $170 billion per year. The gap is anywhere from 68 to 108 billion per year. And so you've got um, 
think a great big gap, but you also have what in my mind is also great opportunities, right? Um, but we have to be able to approach those in an appropriate manner. Uh, and approaching them in an appropriate manner to me means that um, the ADB um, as a multilateral development bank has to do its part in order one to educate the private sector about what the risks are. Um, and I think that this is a great, um, it's an element where if you're an operator um, and you're looking to come into a new um, area or come into a, you know, a new country, um, the work uh, we would call the economic and sector work, but essentially intelligence, uh, right? What is it on the ground? What's the enabling environment? What are the things you require to operate well? What's the policy? Those are the things that we need to do. Um, and I think it's our obligation to governments to do this well. And the second thing is to de-risk investment as well. Um, and so uh, you've got guarantees that can be provided. You've got um, uh, products that in fact can, can uh, take a bit off the risk of the private sector. And I think that's where working hand in hand, you're able to encourage uh, companies to invest in countries that they otherwise wouldn't go into. Um, I'm talking particularly about your low, low income countries, um, you know, your fragile countries as well. Uh, and I think that that's where um, institutions such as ourselves have the greatest role to play. Of course, we bring financing, um, that's also important, um, but the education bit um, as well as the de-risking is super important as well. Yeah, and so much of this is helping governments to understand and minimize their own risk. I mean, they're certainly de-risking for the private sector uh, in Richard's example, subsidizing. But I think to Sue's point, if we're not giving governments the tools to understand what it means to do in for tech and make them comfortable with the risk they're taking on, uh, you may find them move, move back to more traditional approaches. M Morgan, you focus on private sector in your role at IFC. I wonder if you could just comment on what you're seeing in the trends um, and maybe even give some examples of InfraTech. You know, we've heard the windmill example, but it'd be great to hear some other examples of where you're seeing InfraTech play out with real, with real results. Great, Raj. Thanks, and thanks, thanks for the invitation to be part of the panel. Um, so, from the IFC side, uh, back to what Valerie was saying, we see a huge gap in in infrastructure between the demand and the needs of the people to meet the SDGs, and what's happening today, both with governments and with the private sector. So, there's a there's just a huge gap that we need to really be creative to think about how we can can help to meet you know bridge that gap. So, uh, we're trying a few different things. I think one thing we're trying is. Uh, um, to look for new ways to create projects. There's a lot of money out there and it's having a tough time making its way to bankable, investable projects in the developing world and in infrastructure, including in InfraTech. So um, we're, what we're doing at IFC is we're trying to step up and become more of a project developer ourselves. We created a platform called Upstream, which for us is basically taking resources and people and creativity and trying to basically roll up our sleeves and become a developer of projects, not just waiting for the market to develop, but try to kickstart that by putting some, some risk capital uh, to work and some brainstorming human resources to work. So this, this is one this area. Is part of, yeah, not, not to interrupt, but yeah. this is part of the kind of billions to trillions agenda, That's right? right? The That's idea right. there's That's trillions right. of dollars sitting in asset managers' accounts, uh, pension funds that is waiting to be invested somewhere. I mean, you can't get any money off of bonds nowadays in Europe or the US or Japan. So where are you gonna get it? If you can make these infrastructure projects financially attractive and de-risk them enough, you could see a flood of, of funds into That's these right. projects. Exactly right. And, and you know, one, one example of that is we, we canvassed our, our, our investor partners and said, you know, how come you're not investing in more solar, for example, in Africa? And one of the answers was, well, we don't see large enough market, market opportunities with regulations that are clear and the risk uh, framework that, uh, that the previous panelists mentioned to make it worth our time to really spend a lot of time developing projects. So we came up with an idea called scaling solar uh, that we basically, it was, as solar prices are coming down and the solar power is much more competitive today than it was five years ago, how do we get that into some of the challenging markets that are having a tough time attracting real uh, 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 international investors and, and, and far, uh, financing projects with commercial banks? So we decided to basically help with the World Bank and with MIGA, our political risk insurance arm, and with IFC to put together a package of risk tools to say, we'll work with the government. We started in Zambia, in Africa. The government was really keen to lean in and do this to attract real private investment to solar. So together we came up with a risk framework where IFC had a pre-approved investment term sheet. Um, the World Bank had a guarantee for the offtake risk by saying, if you generate power and don't get paid, we will pay you on behalf of the government or the utility. 
uh, and MEGA, the risk arm of the World Bank Group, giving a political risk umbrella. And this was all tendered out in a 50 megawatt solar power project a few years ago, which attracted super interest from the international solar community. And we asked them why, because they basically de-risk the project. As Richard was saying in the in the UK, it, it let investors see a solar project where the risks were really allocated and taken off the table so that the investor could focus on what they were good at, uh, developing, building, financing a project. And the government support was there and the World Bank support was there and IFC was there. We see technology is really giving us a chance to do more and more of that. Uh, and that's something we're trying to lean into from IFC and really help to bring investments to these uh, uh, countries uh, especially as the convergence happens between um, core infrastructure of power and water uh, uh, and energy um, and digital, which we see really happening at the margin. And this solar example only happened because the technology costs were driven so low that actually the, the, the tariff in Zambia was about half of the retail tariff um, before because the price got bid so low because there was so much interest from investors to bid. So now Zambia has got projects with the scaling solar technology or, or kind of business model. Senegal has as well, Ethiopia, even Uzbekistan. So this model of pre-packaging, plug and play, risk, risk adjusted projects to attract private investment, we think is really an interesting innovation in this space. Yeah, and for the, those who are development professionals maybe following this conversation who are skeptical of the idea of using uh, international development agencies to support the private sector. I think the key here is what is that long-term goal? And it's, you know, Richard's example is, yeah, you know, we started out with some subsidies to private companies, but ultimately now it's economic and private companies don't need the subsidy anymore. They can just run with it. And your example of solar is similar, right? The long-term goal is you're providing a short run subsidy in order to make these markets actually work on their own. Yeah. Yeah. And actually, Rick, I can just Raj, build sorry, on sorry, Richard, one, 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 one comment on that, just to close the loop. What we're seeing is the power prices, the tariffs being bid so low, because if you can manage the risk and the and the investors see uh, a low risk project to invest in Ethiopia or Senegal or Uzbekistan, uh, they're willing to take a much lower return because uh, they're adjusting their return expectation based on the risk or the perceived risk. So the tariffs are seeing of two cents, three cents per kilowatt hour, which we've never seen before in any technology. So that's the real benefit. That's that's their nirvana. Great point. Go ahead, Richard. I was just going to build on what Morgan said because I, I, I do think it's it's really really powerful um, that platform and I, I guess my reflection was this that whenever we get into the topic of infotech I always hear people say oh it's about innovation and it's about money and I don't think it's about either and um, nearly all of the technologies that we're talking about that will make a really big difference in the next 10 years already exist and and the money to put behind them has, has always been, from the private sector point, really plentiful. And, and, and one reflection on the last sort of four or five months, I mean, I certainly, as we went into sort of lockdown in, in, in the UK and across much of the rest of the world in sort of March, April, I, I was really worried. I thought, this is going to set everything around climate change back by, you know, because, because businesses are just going to focus in on their own survival. Sustainability is going to become nice to have. It's not really going to be, you know, top of mind any longer. And that's not what's happened at all. We've actually seen, um, whether it's investors or private businesses, a real focus on climate change and sustainability actually go right to the top of the boardroom agenda. It's as if the vulnerability that we've seen through COVID has opened eyes to the vulnerability um, that we all face if we don't get a grip on issues like climate change. And in the case of what this means for the infotech agenda, there's even more investment money that is desperate to find a home in that market than ever before. And it's precisely about the structures that Morgan's been talking about, um, the blending of, of, of risk exposures and the support mechanisms that the public sector through um, uh, multilateral agencies um, or through uh, governments can put in place. That's the key to unlocking this. Yeah, it's interesting. You, I think your training and backgrounds in civil engineering, it sounds like what you're saying is this is not about civil engineering, this is about financial engineering or policy engineering at this stage, right? Getting yeah. this infrastructure built is making those bankable deals that Morgan described. Um, but I wonder if we maybe Sue could put some, um, some more flesh on this concept of, of what Infratech really is, because we've heard a, a wind example and a solar example. Richard earlier showed the newspaper and referred to eco-friendly uh, cars. Uh, so you've got a lot of experience in in wastewater sanitation, um, other municipal services. I was, you know, does Infratech apply to all of these things, or is it really just at the 
sort of the digital end where when you think about solar panels, where, where does Infratech fit when we think of traditional core infrastructure? I would say Infratech is covers everything. And to me, it's actually more the application of smart applications. Um, and I think one point I'd like to just to build on what um, my colleagues were saying, I think it's really important for the private sector, but also for the public sector. And this is where I do think um, multilateral development banks, such as African Development Bank and IFC, when we are working with these clients, because I know that IFC also works with cities, how important it is to weave into the technical specifications and the requirements for this, because otherwise it just won't happen. And um, at EBRD, we have a flagship program to work with municipalities. It's called EBRD Green Cities. Um, we have, we're working with nearly 50 cities so far. And here we combine planning, investment, and policy to help cities identify and address their environmental challenges. And we do this, the heart of it is what we call the Green City Action Plan. And this is where a city benchmarks its environmental performance against a variety of benchmarks. And then they can have a lot of stakeholder engagement to figure out where are their priorities. And we've always included SMART, but we've, you know, right now, um, what, what we're trying to do to maximize the use of SMART, SMART is two things. First of all, um, when, we, when a city identifies, let's say, an environmental priority, for instance, let's say we want to introduce um, clean transport, move away from diesel buses to either CNG or electric buses, but perhaps they still have paper tickets. Um, if you can introduce um, paper ticket, um, um, e-ticketing and move away from paper ticketing, this increases um, the efficiency and improves the service delivery. It provides more seamless um, connection from one mode of transport to another. So for instance, when a city identifies a green city action, we work with them to identify, is there a small smart technology investment that could expand the delivery, the benefits? Lead with green, but there are other benefits that we can include in our EBRD green cities. And um, another- Just to um, say, I love that example, Sue, because I can imagine that uh, the customer experience when you move to digital is much better. You can potentially see where your bus is, you know, is it gonna be late, is it on time? Uh, how full is it, right? You can get all this data that makes the customer experience better. You can have off-peak pricing and um, you know, discounts and, and all kinds of things that might actually mean more ridership, which actually means more revenue for the system so they can afford those investments in CNG or electric vehicles, right? So it is, even though it might sound like a small thing, it does actually connect to the broader transportation system. That's a great, great example. And I, and I think it's so important to improve service delivery. I mean, it's just key. And the other element we're doing is also to look when we work with cities to do a, a smart maturity assessment to see where a city is. We know that cities vary in capacity. You know, it's important for us right now because we've seen that with COVID-19, the cities who had more adapt with digitalization, they fared better um, in dealing with COVID-19. And also what's important is there was a, a McKinsey report a couple of years ago that said adding smart um, investments could help cities reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 10 to 15%. So sometimes these are very small investments, but the cities, um, in order to, so we can help them, we like to do a sort of a, a smart assessment, looking to see how they're cap collecting, capturing, utilizing data, whether or not they have open platforms, um, other sort of platforms that they're working with, how they're working with the private sector. And then we can help guide the city what would be the best approach. And I think just one example, I would also like to say on um, sort of what we think is um, Infratech is, for instance, we have a water sector client in Romania. It's in the city of Pitesh. And they, because they have a very old network that was poorly, poorly laid, um, they have huge water losses. Their non-revenue water is extremely high but they've started to use drone technology to find out where the maximum water losses are. And with this technology, they're planning to reduce their non-revenue water losses by something like 10 to 15%. And this is with just a very small investment because it can help them target very quickly where they should be making the investment. So um, I think it's a really important time right now. And there's so much that um, we, our, our banks can be doing and working with um, organizations like KPMG and others to, to push this agenda. Yeah, if you notice the theme in this, a lot of the examples that we're hearing about have a data component to them, right? Because that's a big part of obviously information technologies, being able to get at low cost data that helps you make the system ultimately more efficient. 
Um, I think Morgan might want to jump in. I had a question for yeah. Valerie too, but go ahead quickly, Morgan. Thanks. I just wanted to build on what Sue said, and, and I fully agree that there's a huge opportunity with cities and you know helping cities really move to smart city and kind of more efficient implementation of technology. We see a huge opportunity, and EBRD is doing some great work there. Um, what, a few examples just to kind of put some meat on the bones, as you asked earlier, Raj, from what we're seeing in our business. Um, I'll give two or three. One is in Myanmar. We're seeing a build out of the rural uh, uh, electricity network using the telecom tower infrastructure that's built by the telecom sector. So again, this convergence idea of digital with core infra energy, um, telecom towers are built out very dramatically already because they were profitable to be done. And the, the Myanmar government led the way with bringing in lots of, of private investment. And now those companies are using that technology, putting solar panels on to meet their own power needs instead of diesel, and then using that solar technology to to electrify rural areas around the telecom towers all over the country. Super innovative idea of using you know, technology and this convergence to meet an, a human need in the SDGs of energy in the rural parts of, of, of a very you know, a, a, a rural country. So that's and one it's an seeing. example of how you can leapfrog too, Morgan. And you I've can been to those that's areas right. yeah, in, yeah. in Myanmar and uh, not many years ago, five, six years ago, it cost $5,000 to get a cell phone, to get that's a SIM right, card. That's right, that's then right. it went down to $250 the next year and then down to a dollar the year after okay. that. And then you would just see them everywhere. That's right. And as you say, the towers are built out. If you can get energy to move that quickly, that's whereas right. traditional energy could be a very long process for electrification. That's a fantastic example. Go ahead. Yeah. So you have the development outcome of meeting the, the energy needs of those communities that otherwise are very, very expensive to meet and at, in a clean way because you're doing it with solar power instead of diesel, which is the traditional way of, of powering these telco, these telco towers. So really, really interesting. And we see that applying to, to many potential markets. Another idea is in Nigeria. There's a, a company we're investing in that's basically using technology to to help the trucking business meet the needs of the shippers. So it used to be a very formalized system using brokers and intermediaries that was quite inefficient. And now these IT platforms are basically setting up a clearinghouse for trucks to bid on, on business. And it's, it's really transformed the way the last mile connectivity is happening in Nigeria through a private kind of innovative use of technology that wasn't being done two, three years ago. So we see technology really as driving huge innovations to to meet the kind of the infrastructure as a service. You know, what's the service we're trying to provide as opposed to what's the asset we're trying to build? Super interesting. That is interesting. It makes me think of the issue of food loss, you know, which is a big issue in many low-income countries. Huge percentages of food get lost between the farm and the plate. And if you can get last mile delivery right, if you can get those systems to be more efficient, you know, it's, it's a kind of infratech maybe. You know, Valerie, we, we've been hearing a lot about cities, um, particularly from Sue, and, I think I believe Africa is the, the fastest urbanizing uh, region of the world. So I wonder sure. if you have anything you want to add about the city's perspective here, what you're seeing across the continent. Sure. Um, it is definitely Africa is, is the, the, the continent that will be the most urbanized, if you will, by 2030. Um, and I think that that presents with it, I'm sure, as you know, challenges, right, for service delivery. Um, but I'd like to actually flip that on its head in the sense of as uh, I think providers of development assistance. I think we have a responsibility to also provide development assistance in rural areas. Um, of course, the urban areas are, are quite important, but our clients are in, they live everywhere, if you will. And one of the things that Richard was saying earlier that really resonated with me is that Infratech isn't really about innovation. Um, and I wanna share with you one of the projects that we have financed done recently, which really brings this to heart and they are rural solar kits that can be used um, where you as the client can pay your monthly sort of payment through your telephone, which you already have and which already has a platform, if you will. It allows you to have more predictable, more reliable power at home. It allows for, at the national level, um, for clean power. And so you're also impacting things like pollution um, and energy costs. Uh, and I think ultimately, if you want to take it a step further, you're dealing with um, the issues of trying to reduce urbanization. So if you can actually provide somebody services in the rural space, um, they will have less of an incentive to move to the city in order to have power. Uh, and so I think those little bits of um, just, uh, I think, policy at the local and rural level can really ultimately end up having a great big impact at the national um, level. And you're ultimately, um, you're satisfying a need 
of your client, sort of wherever that client can be. So I think that this is one of the things which is really super, um, super important. Um, and then finally, you know, just a, a sort of personal anecdote. Um, you know, I live in Abidjan and my garbage gets picked up every week um, by, well, a roving garbage man with pretty much a wheelbarrow. He gets paid about $10 uh, per month. Um, and that, as you can imagine, is a, is a particularly inefficient way of uh, dealing with, with that. I mean, there isn't um, at this point in time any type of um, collective system for either the collection or treatment, if you will, of waste. There are certainly um, uh, sort of, you know, these informal channels because all of your, let's say, water bottles get sold off uh, and the like. But looking at it from a holistic point of view and looking at sort of services, that's exactly the kind of thing that could be helped by type of infra uh, tech, um, where if you're able to, let's say, set up a company that will come and pick up. Um, uh, and then do the sorting, um, then deal with sort of the, the cycling uh, and the like. Those are the kinds of things that are, I think, quick wins um, and that eventually make a city into a much more livable um, place as well. Thank yeah, you. I love that example as well because it brings in the fact that you have so many people in low income countries who are earning as this uh, garbage collector is less than you know, the extreme poverty level in wages. And maybe there's a chance thinking about infrastructure in this holistic way to actually transform those jobs and to make them better jobs and better paying jobs. Um, we've gotten a bunch of interesting questions in. I want to ask Natalie Dombeck uh, to join us back again and, and share with us maybe one or two of those questions and uh, to keep the conversation going. Yeah, thanks so much, um, Raj. And we actually had a really interesting comment con come in from uh, LinkedIn, um, where someone's saying that partnership and collaboration around getting technology deployed into infrastructure is what we need to best advance the SDGs. Um, and Richard already made the link saying we already have a lot of the technology um, to power these solutions. But I did want to ask if we could perhaps hear from our panelists um, around the role of partnerships in, in deploying um, those technology solutions. Great, thanks for that question on LinkedIn. Uh, maybe Richard, you wanna pick it up? Uh, well, with pleasure. And actually, I think it links through to some of the questions that have also been, been asked on the, on the chat function here. Um, so, so I think there's, there's definitely a role for partnerships between the public and the private sector. Um, uh, but there's also a role for a partnership between countries that have human capital in terms of experience in delivering infrastructure with those countries that might not have that uh, expertise. And, and, and I was reflecting, because there's a couple of questions on here, which is about, you know, how do we support um, uh, institutional uh, capital development, particularly in uh, developing countries? And, and it reminded me of, of two things I've been involved in recently. One was um, the last year, the UK government's uh, uh, International Development Infrastructure Commission majored very heavily on effectively subsidizing the use of expertise from one country to another in order to build up the capability that countries need in order to be successfully able to develop their programs. And so that's one way of doing it. That's sort of government to government support or, or multilateral to government support. The other way of doing it is um, the World Economic Forum's Future Infrastructure uh, Council that I've been serving on for the last couple of years, put out a paper about two months ago on unsolicited proposals um, and recognizing yet again, that though it's always been a very difficult place for many countries, actually it can be a really good answer um, if you set up the structures that allow you to consider those proposals in an open and transparent way, it means that you are leaning on a lot of effectively private sector expertise to get through the early development stage work for projects, which otherwise founder because there isn't the lack of capacity on the ground. So just as an example, you know, taking Valerie's point about waste collection, you could have a company that has expertise in sorting and collecting waste, and they could just come to the municipality of Abidjan and say, here's an idea, here's a way we would do it, even though there hadn't been an, a formal you know, request for proposal or process underway at that stage. Correct. But what is critical, um, because you know, unsolicited proposals have got a bit of a shaky history, uh, what is critical is that there is a proper sort of due process within the country to be able to handle those proposals. Um, and I was very struck a few years ago, I think Peru came up with a really, really great system for this, um, whereby effectively they had um, 
they, they specified the areas of infrastructure where they would welcome unsolicited proposals. They had windows in which they would invite the private sector to put forward proposals that met those specific needs. And they were very clear and transparent about the basis on which they would then take up particular offers. Raj, if I could add to that, to this, this idea of partnerships, um, you, you, an example here from the US, um, several years ago, uh, uh, the audience I'm sure knows that there was a big, uh, a major problem with the, the water supply system in Flint, Michigan, where there was lead in the water pipes and, you know, very, very uh, public health crisis for the communities involved there. Um, and, and looking back, uh, uh, people have done some analysis about how could we have predicted that or how could we have known there was a problem? Apparently, uh, if you do a search of the Google searches of the people, the residents of Flint, Michigan, in the six months prior to this becoming a public health crisis known, it, there was a huge spike in the number of requests online for Google, why is my water brown in Flint, Michigan? And if, if there was a way to capture that in advance or in real time, and say for the public health perspective or the city government, okay, we have a problem here. What's going on? As opposed to waiting for six months uh, and then it came out in a different way, what an opportunity to really engage early. So I think that they have partnerships between technology and utilities and infrastructure. It's a huge fertile area. Yeah, interesting example. Go ahead, Seth. Can I add on that? I also think um, what can sort of help this partnership is also open platforms where you see in countries where um, you have real-time data available, the private sector will step in and utilize this data. Um, I live in London and one of my favorite apps on my phone is City Mapper, which uses data from Transport for London, but it tells me where to stand on the tube, you know, you know, what is the most efficient route, um, gives me options via taking um, a mini cab or walking or cycling or all the variety of public sector options. And this is based on Transport for London data. So I'm um, clearly open platforms and that's something that we advocate all the times when we are working with um, cities and governments um, when they are looking at a digital strategy. Yeah, that's an application innovation. And Richard was saying a lot of the innovation is done and in some ways that's true. Like the connectivity, we know how to do it. We know how to um, you know, gather data, we have sensors, we have all that tech, but the applications are the opportunity now, right? And you can innovate if there's an open platform and people have access to that, to that data. Maybe I'll just add a little twist to the question. I'm imagining you know, an activist who's here or someone who just lives in the West Coast of the United States right now, which is ablaze and saying, hey, the climate crisis is here and now. The urbanization challenges, Valerie, that, that we discussed are here and now. Um, this all sounds good. But is there a way to do this faster? I mean, if it really is just about making bankable projects, creating partnerships, if the innovation and the money really is there, why can't we do this much, much faster? What do you see as some of the opportunities to do it quicker or some of the blocking points from your perspectives? Anybody want to pick that up? Valerie, can I call on you? Sure. So I think, uh, look, traditional projects, um, you know, take time, right? Because you have, I don't know, 17 different parties, you know, from the developer to the equity investor to the operator. Um, and so I think it takes some time. Some of the ways in which you can probably cut, down, cut that down is by using um, sort of documents that have already been tried and tested, but, you know, these are your, your standard sort of LMA forms in any event. Um, but I think what probably needs to be done is looking at a project in a holistic manner and getting people to the table at the same time. So if you, for example, look at, let's say an energy project um, in a country um, where you haven't looked at the regulatory environment, you haven't actually sort of tested what's the best practice for that. Um, and you go through your entire sort of financing process um, and then you end up with this regulatory issue that you have, that really means you've wasted sort of years of work. And so I think that's one thing to kind of just look at for what's the enabling environment um, for it. Um, I think some projects as well, you know, that were done in the past, you pretty much, um, a, a producer just has responsibility to produce, right? And the rest of it is offtake is not really my, my issue. But again, if you're looking at something at a holistic level, you want your project to work, but well, you better have a solution, right? And your transmission line better be ready by the time you're, you're uh, producing, right? Um, and so I think those are the kinds of things that are important to look at. And then finally, uh, this issue about partnerships and collaboration, I would look at it from um, a different point of view in the sense that we work a lot with, you know, the shareholders who are um, 
at our board and the like who are at the, you know, uh, they're contributing to uh, our private sector financing, our financing for lower income countries. They also on a bilateral basis um, uh, also contribute to what we call, you know, soft funds. And these soft funds can either help through technical assistance, they can help, um, for example, doing studies. Um, one of the things that comes to mind is a study for the Central African region on a backbone study, uh, sorry, or backbones for ICT. You know, Central Africa for us is a region which typically, you know, it, it's hard um, to work there. It's hard um, to get folks interested unless you're in oil and gas um, and the like. And so if you are able to provide um, these type of, of subsidized um, funds for things like studies, I think that goes a long way to help investors down the line. Thanks. I think Richard wanted to jump in on this as well. Thank you. Sorry, just uh, trying to find the off mute. Um, the other thing that we can do to speed all this up is creating replicability in in solutions. Um, and and one of the um, one of the uh, most systematic approaches I've seen recently to trying to do this uh, is the Hong Kong government has been running something called the Hong Kong 2.0 program for the last couple of years, um, which is driven particularly at um, introducing technology. Uh, into the supply chain of how they approach particular asset classes. So they've chosen four different asset classes. So one of which, for example, is the uh, is the the uh, water sector, um, and they are looking systematically at how can they create ways of operating, for example, using additive manufacturing approaches, um, so that they can just speed up and create much greater efficiency in the delivery. Can I, Great uh, can to I hear. say, oh, go I, ahead, Sue. Yep. I, I fully agree with Valerie though, the enabling environment has to work. Um, and um, Richard's comment on replicability and creating pipelines of projects, because I think um, a lot of times if you want to mobilize the private sector and to bring them into a country, if there's one project, the investment costs are quite high to understand that country's legal framework, you know, perhaps get translators involved. But if there is a pipeline of projects, this can help lower the, the cost. And I know that there's a lot of initiatives out there. Um, EBRD is working with um, IFC. Um, we, work in, we work, first of all, we work a lot together on project preparation um, and ensuring that PPPs can be brought to market quickly. But I think also there's some initiative um, where we're working together to ensure that there can be deliver private sector projects more quickly to the market um, because it's frustrating sometimes, as Valerie was saying, when you wait two to three years for a critical investment need that you know is needed to improve people's lives, to address, you know, it's a crisis situation. And then, you know, two to three years down, you're still just starting the procurement. So yes, there's lots that we can do to undoing, on working together. Yeah, we gotta get both sides of that equation, right? The public and the private, if they don't work together, especially on something like infrastructure where the regulatory environment is so critical. That can certainly slow things down. I know we have another poll question. I want to ask my colleague Natalie to to join us again, and uh, and we'll we'll get a chance to answer this as a group. Hi, everyone. Yeah, time for the last poll. Um, so let me just launch that. Um, hopefully, everyone can see that on their screens now. Um, but we did want to get your take on um, efforts to build back better, and what should they really focus on? Um, should they focus on leveraging infrastructure as a driver of economic growth and development um, or increase automation and electrification? Um, or lastly, leverage investments in Infratech to build preparedness for future pandemics. So please have your say um, by voting here. And yeah, over, over to, to you, Raj. Thanks. Yeah, as Richard said, there is no all of the above. We force you to make a choice so we can see, we can see where people come out. Um, yeah, please do vote. We'd love to get your take. And, I, and I, a big thanks for all the fantastic questions that are coming in on, on many different platforms right now, which we're trying to weave into the conversation as we can. Um, maybe we can see the results. So we're ending the poll now. It seems like we have a pretty clear winner. Let's see, Raj, do you want to comment on that? I think there's a infrastructure as a driver of economic growth is, is the top. Okay, I'm not, seeing, I'm not seeing it yet myself, but that, there we go. Okay, leveraging infrastructure as a driver of economic growth and development. Yeah, certainly. I guess that means that we've maybe either uh, converted some people in this conversation or we were already preaching to the converted, I'm not sure. Um, 
but does anybody have a have a reaction to these poll results or maybe a, a differing view yourself well just just a, just a very quick reaction which is maybe it's just in the way that it's 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 phrased as a as an answer but this is about building back better it's not just about building more again and the opportunity that we've got today is to build greener and to build more resilient infrastructure and actually build the infrastructure that the, the world that we've now woken up to is, is facing. One, for example, that could be much better digitally connected and fly less. And, and so in some ways, it's not just about infrastructure for economic stimulus, great, but let's make it the right sort of economic stimulus. And actually, um, to, to, uh, just to add on that, in addition to more green, greener, more resilient, also more inclusive. Absolutely. Yeah, great point. And I think on, on the greener point, we have a, a good question that's come in, Natalie. Why don't, why don't we hear that one? Yeah, we actually had a few questions um, related to climate change mitigation and management. Um, and we had someone on LinkedIn actually ask um, how rural communities can be better engaged in infra infratech projects, um, and especially in order to reduce the effects of climate change. But then was also um, an individual that was wondering more um, about infrastructure protection. Um, and how, how are you um, encouraging governments to take advantage of the reinsurance markets um, and yeah, mechanisms such as climate resiliency bonds? Uh, I think it would be really interesting to hear um, a few points on that as well. And, and we are getting close to the end. So I'll just ask you to, to answer whatever part of that you'd like, or if there's anything else you want to throw into your answer, this is your chance to do it as we wrap up the panel conversation. Maybe Morgan, uh, can we can we start with you? Great, thanks Raj. Uh, so I think it's a great question. And I think, you know, if we think about the application of digital technology to infrastructure, the solutions in rural areas really will be different than the solutions in, in urban areas. So it's really super important that we kind of think carefully about the needs and how we make it work. And just one, one example of where we're seeing huge potential use of digital technology to really help people that are, that are dispersed um, is in the COVID environment when we have many governments trying to, to get, get, get money to people to help you know, protect the quality of life or livelihood when jobs may be disappearing. Uh, the use of financial technology to do that and cell phone technology really is a game changer. So instead of having people having to go to banks to get $50 or $20 or whatever it is, you can use their cell phone to do that. And what we're trying to, to see if we can't help public sector policymakers and governments use this new technology to really meet the needs of their communities in a way that they can't do through the old technology. Um, so it's huge opportunities to really just hit people. And then once you build that infrastructure and you get systems working that way, that's really changed the way people will, will operate in the future in terms of the banking sector and access to the lending and everything else. So super, it wouldn't be possible without the technology. So I think that the way I think about it, technology really enables new kinds of solutions that we didn't have a few years ago. Right. It's not just about doing things cheaper. It's not just efficiency. It's actual transformation. This is what people mean when they talk about digital transformation. It really changes the way we live and work. Yeah, but to do um, that, you need the digital infrastructure. You need the backbone. You need the cell phone towers and everything else, the broadband, so that people can do that. Yeah, that's right. And to Valerie's earlier point, you know, if you can get that right in rural areas, it also buys you some time because you might see urbanization slow a bit and it gives you a chance to get some of these smart solutions into cities. Valerie, maybe you can give your, your final thoughts as we wrap up today. Sure. So I would actually just think about something which is um, fairly specific. It's about water management um, and, and water, looking at water as a resource, um, particularly for uh, the countries in uh, North Africa. Um, I think it's uh, known that um, Africa generally is the least polluter um, as a block um, and is probably going to have the most effects from, from climate change. And of course, um, you are looking at, you know, how to build your infrastructure to, you know, um, trying to use solar as a, a means of energy rather than anything else. But I think water management is going to be something which is super important um, for countries. Um, and it doesn't matter if you are, you know, Mauritius um, or if you are Egypt. Um, I think um, water, uh, how we deal with it and how you actually get people to understand that it's a fixed resource. Um, and ultimately how you collect um, rainwater, how you recycle it um, from industrial use, some um, like is gonna be super important. Um, finally, there was a mention about um, uh, climate change. Uh, there are programs uh, that exist as well for disaster risk financing in the sort of insurance. Um, and it's been used before um, in Senegal, um, for example, um, where 
able to have a payout on um, a year where I think there was a severe drought. Um, the only thing about that is, it, of course, insurance is a fantastic idea, but you need more and more people to actually subscribe to it in order to bring premiums down. I think premiums are about at a million dollars a year, you know, which is not a small amount of money if you're a government having to make, I think, decisions about where to put your budget and looking at something that may or may not come to pass as risk. Uh, but I think it's clear that climate change is going to probably increase um, your um, extreme um, weather events you know, throughout the continent, whether or not that's droughts or floods or crickets or what have you. And so it's something we ought to be looking at. Thanks very much. Great, great points. And I love the water point that if you think of it as a precious resource, then you can use data and monitoring as in Sue's example of drones to really save every drop of it. And, and they can have huge efficiency gains. Sue, maybe some final thoughts from you. Get, working the mute is hard for me. Um, no, I think um, I agree with what my colleagues have said. There's so much that can we should be focusing on with climate change and climate mitigation. And what we see is there's, there's two types of investments, adaptation as well as mitigation, but both are equally important. And digital technology, I think, is so important also because also if we wanted to bring in new investors, a lot, want, a lot of these investors want to be able to measure the results of these investments. And this is where digital technology can really play a big role. Thank you for that. And uh, before we go to our special guest, uh, maybe Richard, you can give us your final thoughts. Uh, well, just very quickly, in view of time, to, to, to note that this issue of infrastructure resilience, I think, is, is a really huge issue. Um, there's the Coalition for Climate Resilient Infrastructure was kicked off last year by the World Economic Forum and Willis Towers Watson, and is truly trying to get under the skin of what we see really is the mispricing of infrastructure investments that don't sufficiently take account of their resilience over their lifetimes. And I do think there's a huge role for regulators uh, particularly of networked assets um, to start to insist on assets being built uh, to withstand you know, all reasonable scenarios um, of climate risk that they might face. Right, it might look cheap to do that inexpensive infrastructure plan right now, but if it doesn't last you through the first storm, it wasn't right. such a good deal. Um, listen, I wanna give a huge thank you to all of you who've been part of the panel today. I know all of us who are watching around the world are giving you some virtual applause. I'm sure we would be doing a roar, roaring applause in person if we were actually together. It was fascinating. Uh, so thank you so much for this. And um, again, we're, we're gonna now hear from a special guest. We've got someone uh, who has spent uh, the last three decades or so as a investor in infrastructure, Opuyo Oforio Kuma, who is the Senior Director for Strategy and Investor Relations at Africa 50. Opuyo has been uh, an investor in infrastructure all over the world, um, but it's now focused particularly on the African continent and is, um, is in particular thinking about making investments uh, in infrastructure using a, a new modern technology focused approach. And he's been listening to this conversation. So I wanted to get your, your reflections if we could, Opuyo. Thank you very much, Raj, for the opportunity to say a few words uh, after what has been a truly informative and fascinating panel, as, as you said. Uh, just by way of brief background, Africa 50 is a Pan-African infrastructure investment platform. Um, so my focus will be on, on African infrastructure today. Um, I should firstly say, though, relating to the SDGs, uh, that you know the pressing environmental and social challenge that we're facing as a world um, is really as a result of our infrastructure choices. So the way that infrastructure is designed, is built, is operated, uh, directly impacts a country's ability to provide access to public services and prefer, uh, preserve uh, its national resources. Uh, but today's technology and data-driven solutions enable us to make better choices and deliver projects that are more efficient, smarter, greener, and resilient in the way that we've heard the panelists uh, talk, uh, talk about. Now, these are SDG themes that investors like ourselves uh, look for. Uh, aside from ensuring that the regulatory stipulations are, are met. And we can see various visible trends on how technology is changing infrastructure, you know, in the landscape in Africa. For example, in construction technology, which has doubled in the past decade, uh, we can see that technologies are allowing barriers to entry to drop. Uh, we see that data collection tools are more accessible and they enable more advanced project analytics to be done. Uh, we see that increased digitalization, it's inevitable, um, but of course the uh, outcomes will also vary. Uh, and with the impetus of COVID-19, as we've heard, uh, new technologies are going to continue to become more developed and uh, commercialized on the continent. 
various examples uh, exist. We've heard some from the panelists today. If you look at, for example, the energy space, uh, solar microgrids, power sharing systems in rural areas can allow, for example, a house or a school to become a micro power station for a neighborhood or a small community. And this helps meet energy demand, provides clean and affordable power, for example, in line with SDG 7, which is one of the key um, SDGs that we focus on in Africa. In the healthcare space, artificial intelligence is enabling uh, tech smart health advice and diagnosis. And in some countries, uh, chatbot-based telemedicine platforms are helping communities safely navigate uh, the impacts of the COVID uh, pandemic. And of course, COVID has highlighted the need for more ICT and tech tech enabled infrastructure in Africa. And it really reminds us, as you've also heard touched on today, that you can't really get sustainable development without putting human life first. So the S in ESG is taken on a much higher profile today in Africa, and I dare say around the world. But now digitalization in Africa is already happening. We're seeing broadband connections rising uh, on the continent. And you know, uh, I dare say you see this in other parts of the world too. And uh, in countries like Kenya, where you have M-Pesa and Majuri Paga, Africa has become a global leader, if not the global leader in mobile money platforms. That already is transforming the way that ordinary people who have been previously unbanked are now able to access. But you know, whilst Africa is becoming increasingly urbanized, there is still 65% of the African population that lives in the rural area where connectivity is, is quite low. And with internet connectivity being key to helping drive inclusive growth, it's really important that there's more investment in this. And one of the big initiatives that we're seeing in Africa, which we hope will be implemented next year, is the African Continental Free Trade Area. Uh, this will help support intra-regional trade and partnership, both through phys physical and digital infrastructure. World banks have, have, have estimated about 100 billion required by 2030 uh, to actually achieve universal broadband Af uh, access in Africa with 4G and, and fiber cable uh, expansion. Uh, in Africa alone cannot fund this. We need to have private investment coming in. And this is part of our mandate at Africa 50, which is to develop and invest in bankable infra infrastructure projects um, and also mobilize public and private capital locally, internationally uh, for African infrastructure investment. We need large scale digital infra infrastructure projects like broadband, et cetera. Uh, we need to build supporting ecosystems such as tech hubs, innovation cities, where skills can be developed and new technologies and knowledge shared. This is key. And I'm pleased to report that Africa 50 is currently de developing one such project in Rwanda. It's called uh, the Kigali Innovation City. We also sponsored, launched an inv innovation challenge last year aimed at finding solutions for last mile connectivity on the continent. Uh, and this particular program received 600 solutions of which about 85% of them uh, came from African sources. So this we believe is showing that Africa is ready for an ICT boom, much like we saw with GSM 20 years ago. But attracting capital today in Africa is not the easiest thing, especially in the current circumstances where we have seen massive capital flight from the continent. So we need to find ways, we need to find innovative financing mechanisms to help mobilize both domestic and international funding for Africa. And one such mechanism that we advocate strongly at Africa 50 is asset recycling. This has been used successfully in countries like Australia, the UK, Mexico, and Japan, amongst others, and is a, is a mechanism that enables governments to unlock capital that's currently tied down in state-owned infrastructure assets through offering these to private investors under the concession model, of course, a model that is well tried and tested overseas. And if this is done successfully in Africa, this could unlock potentially billions of US dollars that can be used to fund new infrastructure for African countries as part of their COVID-19 uh, recovery programs, especially in the health sector. So with the right collaborative frameworks, and I heard one of the speakers on the panel talk about unsolicited proposals. This is one of those frameworks, which if it's put together properly, can enable asset recycling to help unlock capital with relative speed. It's also important because Africa historically uh, built a reputation of when there's crises, we look for donor help. Nothing wrong with that, but today, if we are able to make Afri uh, asset recycling work in Africa, we can actually do a lot of this using our own assets and resources on the continent. This should send a very powerful message. And of course, asset recycling can work in the ICT space on broadband data centers and, and other key infrastructure. Uh, and I'm pleased to tell you that Africa 50 is also uh, right now working on one such transaction in one of our uh, 28 shareholder countries. 
So finally, Africa 50, we are playing our part alongside institutions such as those that have spoken on today's panel. And we are strongly committed to helping Africa respond and succeed uh, in coming out of this COVID-19 crisis. Uh, it, for us, it's about investing to increase smarter, greener, and more resilient infrastructure. And as been said on the panel today, building Africa back better. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak today. And uh, I wish you all very well. Thank you so much, Apuya. That was fa fascinating. You really encapsulated a lot in those remarks. And I'm, I'm very thankful that you underlined two things we didn't get to, of course, asset recycling, but also broadband. I mean, if there's one thing this pandemic has shown us is you are really in, uh, in a different kind of situation entirely. If you have access to broadband, you can work. Your kids yep. might be able to go to school virtually. You can socially distance. And if you don't have broadband, you're in a very, very different situation. It's become a huge divider in the world. And uh, when you think about the future of, of infrastructure, the need to make that a priority is absolutely dramatic. So thank you for, for underlining that today. We're a bit over time. Otherwise, I'd love to have a conversation with you. But thank you again. Thank you very for much. All of the work that you're doing with AFCA 50. And thanks for being a part of this. Um, and I just want to say to everyone who's followed the conversation today, thank you for the questions. Thank you for your participation in this. And this is a great way to get going with our UN General Assembly coverage here at DevX because Infratech is clearly a top issue. It's the sort of issue that people should be talking about in the halls of the UN. Uh, they're going to be do that, doing that virtually this year, but hopefully we've helped to put this issue a little bit more front and center uh, for all of us as we, as we think about the UN General Assembly and this week uh, to come. Um, we do have a website at DevX I want to point your attention to. It's uh, UNGA75. You, um, let me just make sure I'm giving you the exact correct thing. It's, uh, let's see, unga75.devx.com, unga75.devx.com, where you can find a recording of this session, as well as information uh, on all of the coverage that we're doing on many different issues, including some special coverage we're doing in partnership with the Skoll Foundation. So come and check that out. Follow us on social media. This is one of many uh, engagements we'll be doing during the course of this week. A big thank you to our partners at KPMG for making this event happen. And thanks again to all of you. Be well.